too. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's hard. Okay. Um, all right, Miles. I think you could. I think we can start. Uh, recording is started. Okay. Great. Hello. All right. Uh, just before I get started, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. 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 You right. can. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you to everybody who's here for this AMA. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Miles Maxer. I am the director of the Ant Network, which is an organization that uh, kind of uses the science uh, behind ants and ants themselves to communicate science as a broader topic to the general public. Um, I also really am cool. a re researcher at Montana State University. Uh, and I also work with the National Park Service to identify the ants of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, the plan for today is just to go over kind of diapause, what is diapause, uh, how that relate to, relates to ants. And what I'm hoping to do here is actually have a pretty nice dialogue with everybody. Uh, we don't want this to be like a super formal seminar. Uh, the goal here is to have a nice kind of conversation as this goes on. But we're going to start out and so we're going to start with... Um, actually some questions that were submitted by the com uh, community, and then we're going to kind of change the format a little bit after that. Uh, but feel free to ask questions. And one thing I do want to say, just even before we get started into kind of the technical details of diapause and ants, is that this is a really unknown science. Like, we do not know a whole lot about how insect diapause occurs. And that actually makes uh, your engagement kind of as hobbyists really exciting because we have the opportunity to learn from each other um, about diapause, about ant behavior, uh, and biology. So I'm pretty excited about this discussion, and I hope everybody else is too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before I take any questions, I just want to answer kind of the question of what is diapause? Um, because that's not necessarily a term that everybody will have heard. Um, oftentimes people will say uh, hibernation when we're talking about this subject with ants. But the technical term when we're dealing with insects is actually diapause. And uh, I've got a quick uh, quote here for you guys. So diapause is a form of developmental arrest in insects that is much more like hibernation in higher animals. So like bears will hibernate. It enables insects and related arthropods to circumvent adverse season. So Winter is the most commonly avoided uh, kind of season that uh, insects will go into diapause for. But diapause is also used to avoid like hot, dry summers and then periods of food shortage as well. So it's not only specific to cold temperatures, but that's kind of the main focus when we think about ants. Cool. Uh, is there any, do you want to go over any of the basics um, before we dive right into questions or, um, because a lot of people, like especially newer ant keepers, don't even have a fundamental understanding of um, like what, what, when to do it, how to approach it, um, what temperatures, what's safe, what's not. And um, a lot of the time, uh, like come spring, we hear a lot of stuff in the server um, saying so-and-so, half my colony died or um, the queen isn't waking up, or whatever. Do you have something prepared for that, or would you rather just jump right into questions? I mean, we can go over that for just a moment now. Um, okay. There are some basics just to catch everybody up on it. Um, so ants in temperate zones, so that's going to be like North America, most of Europe, um, some parts of Australia, you know, places around the world, temperate regions, they'll actually go into a state of diapause, usually during the winter, but occasionally during summers as well. And basically what's important for ant keepers to understand is that this, is, this seems to be, um, as far as we can tell, an important part of ant uh, physiology, ant behavior, um, and it's something that we generally like to try and replicate in captivity. So if you're dealing, let, let's make a couple of examples, right? So here in Montana, we have an ant species called Campanotus modoc, okay? 
And Campanotus modoc lives in an area where it snows for like four or five months out of the year. We're actually expecting snow here tomorrow morning. Uh, so that's terrible, but uh, that, that's coming to us. So let's think about this as, as an ant keeper. So I'm an ant keeper and I've got a Campanotus modoc colony. Well, all of the Campanotus colonies out in the wild uh, have already stopped laying, the, the queens have stopped laying eggs. The larvae, the pupae, uh, the pupae will have closed and larvae have gone into a dormant state. So what's important for me to understand is that the ants out in the wild are preparing for winter, right? So going into what we used to kind of call hibernation in the ant keeping community before we came to understand that diapause is actually a more uh, accurate way to look at, uh, look at the situation. So as an ant keeper, I want to make sure that my ants are absolutely as healthy as possible. And it appears uh, from a lot of anecdotal evidence over uh, the last decade or so that hibernation is actually really, really important for the health of the ant colony. So what we want to do as ant keepers is do our best to let the ants kind of live their natural lives. And that's what's going to produce most likely uh, the healthiest ant colonies in captivity. So as an ant keeper, I'm going to be looking at temperatures, you know, what time of year uh, do, do the temperatures change? Uh, what, what kind of weather changes are, and then most importantly, actually, what are the wild ants doing? So if I'm observing that wild ant colonies are kind of ramping down, they're slowing production, maybe the temperatures out, outside are, are getting lower and lower every day, uh, we're having more rain, that's when I'm going to begin adjusting the ant colonies in my laboratory. Okay, so what we do is that we actually uh, have kind of like mini fridges, so mini, you know, miniature fridges, and we can dial them into a certain temperature range uh, to kind of mimic what the temperatures are outside. So what we do is we put our colonies into those uh, units, depending on the uh, weather outside, the temperatures, and we will adjust those temperatures over time to kind of mimic what the outside is like. Now, it's important to say it does get into like the negatives in Fahrenheit here in Montana. There's a... Uh, a repeating sound here um, that's coming through. I'm not sure what that is. I'm not seeing it any, anything on my end. I mean, there was there was something a little bit earlier. Um, I already muted that person. Okay, great. Uh, so anyway, yeah, there you go. Okay, so anyway, um, at, like I was saying, we'll put our colonies into, say, a mini fridge, and uh, we will use that to kind of reduce the temperature and try and mimic the outside temperatures. It is important to note that, like, I'm not trying to freeze my ants, right? So if it's below freezing outside, we're still going to keep our temperature uh, in the mini fridge at least above 36 Fahrenheit and usually around 40. It's important for people to understand that the temperature inside of an ant nest isn't necessarily the same as, like, the ambient temperature when you walk outside. So even just a couple of feet down below in the soil, you're actually going to see soil temperatures between 40, maybe even 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So the ant colonies aren't going to be as, thank you for that conversion, the ant colonies aren't going to be um, as cold as maybe you're expecting them to be. Um, so I want to make sure I get to questions, but basically the point is we want to mimic the conditions that the ants are experiencing in their natural lives because it does seem to have an effect on the health of the colony. So with Campanotus, for example, they have some pretty, um, I don't want to say strict, but very uh, kind of rigid timelines from when the queens will lay their batches of eggs. So in some ants, the queens will just constantly lay eggs. In other ants like Campanotus, they'll actually have multiple batches over the year. And that kind of rate of egg laying seems to be affected as to whether or not the colony has had the opportunity to... Um, go through that diapause uh, in in the winter. Okay. So I guess we can jump into questions here. I guess that, that's a pretty comprehensive overview. Um, so uh, okay, um, first question. Um, is there a simple means of figuring out if an ant species hibernates? Did, is my mic still working here? Hey, Sol, your mic just cut out um, halfway through that. 
Oh, for real? Yeah, no, Discord has been kind of messed up lately. Um, one second. All right, so uh, that, that was a pretty good overview. Um, uh, are we good to jump straight into questions? Does anybody have questions regarding what's already been covered? Um, again, this is a lot more, this is a lot less formal than the previous ones. Um, so if you have questions, just um, say you want to ask it in the voice text channel and Miles or myself or some other moderator can, can um, kind of give you the, the go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, uh, yeah, let me unmute you. So the question I have is about a colony I will be getting soon. It's a um, Master Barbaros colony that I'm ordering from Spain. I live in Portugal. And by the time it gets here, I assume it will be Monday. It will have five to ten workers. By the time it reaches their diapause that starts in November, they won't have many workers. Should I hibernate them or should I heat them up with a heating mat to let them develop to the winter? Yeah, so this is a, a good question, and I'm going to try and generalize it a little bit just so it's you know, as useful for everybody here as possible. But it's a great question because a lot of ankeepers end up with this situation uh, going into the fall or, you know, whatever time it, it is to hibernate or, or put their ants into diapause. Um, and they don't really know when that should occur, right? especially when we're dealing with small kind of incipient ant colonies like what you're describing. So Mester Barbarus is kind of a unique ant because in certain parts of its range, it's going to be having a very different kind of kind of winter experience than in other areas. But the first thing that I would do if I were you and you're looking at uh, this Messer colony, that Messer colony that is, is I would be looking at whether or not they have a lot of uh, brood in development, okay? So you never want to cut an ant colony that has lots of brood, like lots of uh, eggs, large larvae, especially pupae. You never want to put them into a state of diapause unless they're ready. And you want to see that brood go through to a close prior to putting them into diapause. Now, there are exceptions for this, like Campanotis, for example, will almost always overwinter with larvae as, I think, first or second instars, and those go into a suspended development state. But almost always, if an ant colony has a lot of brood, they're not ready for lower temperatures. So what I recommend is looking at kind of what the brood levels are in the colony of that, that messer colony you're talking about, and let's say they have a whole bunch of larvae or a whole bunch of pupae, or the queen just laid a new batch of eggs, by all means, keep them warm. Let that second generation of workers be close. If they stop laying eggs and they don't have a lot of brood going, that might be kind of a signal to you. Let's put these into diapause. Let them go through the winter, and then the queen will pick up her egg laying afterwards. One more thing. If they do have eggs, what's the ideal temperature to keep them at? Well, I can't get into specifics with the specific European species, but I'm sure that Seraphine, uh, or I think I'm uh, saying that correctly, would be able to help you with that. Um, but uh, usually you want to make sure that you're giving your ants uh, a temperature gradient, actually. So you don't want to keep the entire colony at a, at a single temperature. My recommendation is always to give them a warm and a cool side of their nest so that they can regulate the temperature themselves according to their needs. I think I read that. Oh, uh, on a video, saw it on a video. I think it was NC hours. Something like that. Mm. Talked about it. Okay, okay. Do anyway. <laughs> All right. Do we have any more like um any more ge general questions um regarding what's already been covered? Um. Anybody? Uh, I got so, here kind of yeah, late, but I have a question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so down here in Florida, it doesn't get that cold, so obviously, so a refrigerator is uh, too cold uh, to put them into diapause. So what do you recommend? I think he's already spoken to this a bit. He said, um, he, like, a, like, wine coolers in general. Okay, that's what, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. 
wine coolers can be a great way to do that. But I would say that, uh, although I've not spent a lot of time in Florida, um, many of the ants there probably don't go through a major diapause sequence. Um, so if you kept them in, say, like an air-conditioned home or something that's not very warm, um, and if that's a very different temperature than, say, how warm that you usually keep them, they might go through diapause just fine. But a wine cooler really is the kind of the easiest solution to really make sure you're dialed in at the right temperature. Great. Thank you. Okay. And that's a good uh, segue into um, the first question that we have. Uh, so uh, Dumex um, asks, is there a simple means of figuring out if an ant species hibernates? That's a great question. And what I was saying earlier was that we don't know a whole lot about ant diapause. Uh, just as a reminder, when we, we think about kind of the concept of hibernation with ants, we're talking about a state of diapause. And that is a little bit different than how like a mammal might go through hibernation. Um, but in terms of de determining if an ant species uh, goes through diapause, um, what I would generally do is look at what happens to the colonies out in the wild. Okay. So, and I think most people here are keeping ants that are fairly local to them. Uh, our European colleagues might have a little bit of a different situation, but for most of us, we're keeping ants that we could feasibly find in our backyard or within an hour's drive or so. And what's great about that is we can see what happens uh, with those live colonies. So if they remain active, great. You, you don't need to um, try and simulate it, an environment that would make them not active. Uh, but if they, if they do go into a state of diapause or if the colony you know, really slows down, there's not a lot of brood around, um, that's a pretty good cue to show you that uh, the colony does go through a period of diapause uh, in the winter. So uh, I wish I could tell everybody that, yes, there's this fantastic website and it all has, you know, the perfect hibernation temperatures, you know, for diapause and whatnot <laughs> and uh, everything. But we don't know. And that's what's so exciting about ant science, myrmecology, is that there's so much that we don't know about. Um, and that's also what's really exciting about kind of straddling the community of ant keepers and then also ant scientists, because we have this great opportunity to work with you guys, citizen scientists, you know, the people that inspired me to go into science myself, um, to really solve these problems and learn about these things. And what I would say is that like ant diapause is actually something of great interest to places even like the National Institutes of Health here in the United States. Um, what happens to animals in the winter, uh, periods of suspended development, those are all really critical things to understand especially in the context of a changing climate. So I'm really excited to kind of have this dialogue with you guys. And I encourage everybody to keep pretty good notes on what they observe in their colonies, especially as it relates to diapause, because that, those notes could actually help inform science. Yeah, and Miles, it absolutely goes the other way as well. Um, part, a huge part of the, the reason that we have these um, is so that we can kind of in, inspire um, ant keepers and um, young kids especially like listening in and who have, have questions and all that to um, really find a passion in entomology and pursue this kind of thing so again thanks for having these with us it's, it, it really it, <laughs> okay um, so the next question is uh, ant guy also asks is it possible for all ants to go into a diapause state or are there species that cannot that's a good question um I would say as a scientist, I can't definitively say that uh, an ant species can or cannot go into a state of diapause. We don't necessarily know that, particularly because diapause, as I said at the very beginning, has a pretty broad definition of basically a change in physiology and development that occurs because of a change of a season. Okay, so even ants in the tropics go through, they go through drought, they go through food shortages. And that could hypothetically put a species into a state of diapause. Um, so we don't definitively know. We don't have this like special list that says, yes, this ant goes into diapause, this ant doesn't. Uh, but what I will say is that from a practical standpoint um, in ant keeping, uh, there's a pretty good line that you can draw 
between uh, ants that are in temperate areas where you do have major seasonal variation and ants that are maybe closer to the equator and have less seasonal variation. But, uh, you know, I was in Madagascar recently and they don't necessarily go through a uh, spring, winter, fall uh, or a spring, summer, uh, fall, winter cycle, but they have a rainy season and a dry season. Okay, the monsoons come through. Well, that dry season, when there's not a lot of food very, uh, availability, uh, that can induce a state of high diapause as well. Um, so it really is kind of a complicated topic. But I, I really do appreciate that question because it helps us think about ants kind of more generally having these kind of physiological, physiological changes that occur uh, as a result of, you know, weather patterns and, and different changes in uh, kind of the conditions in which they live. Okay. That kind of provokes, <laughs> I have my own questions regarding that, but we'll, we'll continue with this and then open it up. Um, so uh, Mango asks, is it beneficial to hibernate some colonies who haven't been doing great longer than others? So, That's uh, an interesting question. Yeah, so I, yeah. I guess he's, I guess what he's asking is, um, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's a bit of a garden path question, isn't it? Because it can be read two ways. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, what I would say is that you should be giving all of your colonies, uh, you know, as realistic, you know, realistically as much attention as you can give them to make sure that they're successful. Um, and I don't ever want to suggest that, like, putting an ant colony in diapause is just going to magically make the queen more productive, or that the colony is just suddenly going to be healthier. There are so many different factors that affect colony health, that affect uh, reproduction, uh, worker development, you know, laying of eggs. We could go on and on. Um, and it looks like Mango has clarified the question there in the chat. Do they recover more? if hibernated longer, if the colony's not doing well. That's and uh, that's not necessarily something that I can answer because I don't know that we have really much of a um, you know, data set based on that. I don't think we have that much anecdotal evidence. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, I have had personally great success in putting, say, a Campanotis colony that only had three workers after their first year through diapause and then the queen will come out and lay a whole bunch of eggs and you'll see a lot more success during that kind of second growing season so um there is definitely kind of validity to the idea of uh still treating the ants as though they need diapause even if the colony hasn't performed to your expectations go ahead did somebody have a question? <laughs> I guess not. I actually skipped over um, the first three, so I'm going to go back up. Um, the uh, Halalifer asks, uh, Fidele uh, pallidula is a species that is found in Morocco and South Europe. Some people say that they need hibernation, diapos, I think, and some say that they do not. Um, and some say it depends on where the queen is from. Do you know if all Paladula need hibernation as they live in Europe, where most ants hibernate, and Africa, where I assume most ants don't hibernate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I'm looking at here is a sheet that shows uh, Fidole Paladula uh, being distributed throughout southern Europe, uh, the southern European peninsula, and then also North Africa. Um, it, it it's difficult to give like really personalized direction with a single species without being able to look into it more. But what I can say is that if you follow kind of the principle of observing your ant colony's behavior, you're going to have a better idea of whether or not they need to go into diapause. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. I just wasn't sure. It looked like we were having some issues. So, yeah, Discord uh, has been messing up. Um, if it's cutting out for you guys, um, Discord has been hiccuping since about ten in the morning uh, Pacific. So, um, 
I mean, I, it, like, if, if the recording is, isn't um, coming through clear, I'll, um, I'll, I'll let you know and we can, we can go over things again. Um, but otherwise, uh, hopefully you'll be able to catch it in the recording and the subsequent um, transcription. Um, you can lower the bit rate because the bit rate is, can sometimes mess with the, the audio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question, Armjone asks, uh, do ants hibernate for the same length of time and at the same temperatures? I think you spoke to that a little bit. Do you have more to add? Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question, actually. Uh, it's not an easy one to answer, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a species here in North America called Prenelephus, uh, Prenelephus in Paris, right? So that's the winter ant. They're also called false honeypot ants. They've got tons of different names that we go by. And they actually have their peak activity uh, during the very early spring months. And I know Mr. I Love the Ants knows way more about this genus and species than I do because they're not out here in Montana. But what I can say is that their whole life cycle is based on being active during months that other ants pretty much aren't active. So there is lots of variation in how long ants uh, will go into a diapause. And some, spe uh, some species, some genera, say like um, Campanotus, will often go longer than, say, a genus like uh, Myrmica or Tetramorium. Um, and there's lots of different kind of reasons we think why that could be. But... Uh, I don't want to get too specific with that stuff, but we do know that, uh, say, Campanotus, for example, produces, uh, I think it's glycerol, which is actually a kind of a compound that is, um, it stops water molecules from freezing in some way. I'm not a physicist, but what I can tell you is it basically works as antifreeze in the ant's hemolymph. And it also seems to have an effect on those ants, kind of their coordination, their ability to really uh, function. So it seems like it takes a little while for the, for the Campanotus to actually kind of get that out of their system. Um, so there's lots of different drivers why you would see kind of varied lengths and extents, extent of diapause in different genera, different species, even in the same area. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Dill has a very interesting question. Um, so he said he asks, "Just wanted to know how tropical ants deal with cold temperature over extended periods. If I were going overseas for a week or so, can I make my ants go into diapause for that period?" Southeast Asian ants like Carabara diversa, uh, Campanotus irritans, Odonta panera, uh, dentic denticula. Den <laughs> sorry, <laughs> denticulata, uh, etc. Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to note that Latin is just kind of a curse that we deal with. Um, so uh, if anybody ever struggles with getting through a Latin name, we've all been there. Uh, but <laughs> uh, specifically, like the question of can you put your ants into a state of diapause because you want to go on vacation? That's actually a question I get all the time. Like pretty much every week. And uh, the short answer is not really. Um, it's usually not a good idea for the colony's kind of health and development to just like say, put your ant colony into a fridge. Uh, <laughs> when it's laying eggs or they've got larvae and development and stuff, uh, especially if they're not used to those temperatures. And, uh, you know, particularly uh, if they are tropical ants. So a really sudden change in temperature is probably going to have a pretty substantial impact on the colony. But here's the good news. You know, I've left ants for three weeks at a time. And ants are actually really, really good at, at managing resources. The biggest kind of key to leaving an ant colony, if you're going to go on vacation, or you know, I do a lot of traveling. I have to do this. And if I don't have somebody who can man the lab every day, there's certain kind of precautions that we take to try and keep our colonies healthy. And one of those is that we make sure that they always, always, always have access to water. It is really, really critical that they have access to water. So the next step is that you want to make sure that they have plenty of food stores. But you got to be strategic about this. 
if you just throw in like a uh, like a like a dead mouse or something, okay, and you're like, here's their protein. It's huge. There's lots of food there. Uh, the, the ants will be fine for three weeks. That's really not a good approach. What you want to do is kind of ramp up the feeding and food availability. Uh, yeah, that's right, Milta, or a dead hamster. But you want to make sure that uh, that food availability is kind of high for the couple of weeks prior to you leaving. So basically, the ant colony has as much food as you can possibly give them. So then you want to make sure that um, you're providing them with kind of a balanced diet. So what I'm not suggesting is that you just give them a whole bunch of sugar water for a couple of weeks and you're like, yes, they're perfect. They're going to be just fine. You want to make sure that it's a really balanced diet depending on what the species uh, needs. Okay. This is one of the great things about harvester ants, for example. They store their food uh, in granaries, so chambers. But you might be dealing with a species like, uh, or a genus like Myrmica, for example. Okay. They don't really keep food stores the same way. So you just want to make sure you have as much food availability and variation prior to leaving. And then you're going to leave them with a source of sugars, okay? So maybe a slice of apple with some sugar water on it, uh, and then also a test tube full of water, for example. So what's going to happen is the ants will probably, they'll hopefully have some kind of food stored up. They'll have the, the lipids, the proteins from the insect food, and then you'll have the sugars that the ants need to kind of survive for that extended period of time. Sorry, just um, because some people might know lipids? Uh, like fats. Yeah. Great. Uh, so the next question is uh, another question from Ankai. Uh, what is a good way to tell when to put your ants into hibernation and when to take them out? I'm sorry, Sol, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm cutting out or what's going to... What is a good way to tell uh, when to put your ants into hibernation and when to take them out? Okay, when to, when to put them in, when to take them out. Okay, well, <laughs> this is often a source of debate within the community, okay? And uh, as a general rule, like I said before, you want to be trying to basically mimic uh, the behavior of the ants in their natural range, okay? But that can be kind of painful, especially for people like me in Montana, where it feels like we have winter from like October through August. Uh, and while that's not exactly <laughs> true, uh, it lasts forever. Okay. It's a really long winter period. And we're thinking, really, we're going to leave our colony in the fridge for five months. Um, and the short answer <laughs> is that no, you pretty much don't have to have to keep that perfectly aligned. Um, what I generally do is as kind of a, uh, as a minimum, I want to make sure that those ants go into a state of diapause for at least eight weeks. Okay, so about two months. And then I usually max out at about four weeks. I mean, I'm sorry, about four months. Um, and that usually gives kind of an ample amount of time for the queen to slow down. You have the ovaries kind of shut down throughout that period. The colony goes into a state of diapause. Um, and you're usually able to pick them out, uh, take them out earlier. Um, and uh, usually, say, say you're going to see ants kind of running around your house, uh, let's say March, okay? You could probably take those, the, the colonies out that you have in captivity um, sometime in late January, maybe February. So maybe a, a month or give or take uh, prior to when you might see those ants outside. Um, but really what you don't want to do is go below kind of that minimum threshold for diapause. So I do recommend that you do, at the absolute minimum, six weeks. Uh, I, I tend to do between eight weeks and uh, 16 weeks. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's a question that I've actually been kind of wanting to ask, and I'd, I'd like to open this up more generally to everybody. Um, I've always suspected that, like in, um, in nature... Uh, go, getting ready and and uh, uh, physiologically um, getting ready and going into hibernation is a generally a, a rather gradual thing. Um, like they're they're not going to just shut off like you like uh, like it when when you stick them in the fridge um, because that's not what happens in nature. Um, how much would you say that that plays a role in um, how we should go about uh, hibernating our ants in particular? 
Um, and should we should we gradually put them into hibernation and gradually take them out? And have you seen any uh, positive effects of, of that kind of approach or heard anything? And um, not just Miles, if anybody else has something to share on this, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, just as a reminder, we're talking about diapause here and, uh, and not hibernation. But that's <laughs> sorry, okay. sorry. Yeah, you're in, right. In the hobby. No, no worries. <laughs> um, you know, here's what I have to say kind of about that. There is kind of the ideal way that we would do this, and we would just pretty much always mimic, you know, outside conditions and, and be really good at mimicking how nature does things. But realistically, um, I don't have the ability to put the ants through like a multiple month long process for where they go through a gradual change. But the good news is there's still ways that we can kind of gradually get our ant colonies ready for diapause. And usually they do that themselves. Uh, generally within my colonies, I can see that the colony is slowing down, even if I haven't changed the conditions. That being said, uh, prior to taking them off diapause, I usually would say turn off the heating cables uh, about one to two weeks prior to putting them into diapause. Uh, if you're dealing with a really fast-growing species like Tetramorium that thrives on heat, but you know you want to put them through diapause, I'd try and give them at least three weeks so they can get their brood through that whole um, process prior to diapause. But you take them off the heat, and then what I actually do that is I then put them in my mini fridges, but I put them on kind of the warmest setting. And what that does is it allows the ants not to get too cool to where they can't really go about their duties in the colony as well. Uh, but at the same time, it's super clear that like it's not summertime, right? Things have changed. The change of the season has occurred. And that tends to work just fine. What I think is actually a little bit more important to talk about, though, is just that how important it is not to simply take your ants like off of the heating cable and just throw them into the fridge, right? So you don't want to have like a major uh, environmental change like that. That that is some that's kind of asking for trouble in an ant colony. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is I wanted to talk about taking your ants out of that period of diapause, um, or what we kind of colloquially call hibernation. And what I do recommend uh, is taking the ants out. Maybe you have them in a mini fridge, wine cooler, in your garage, uh, wherever you have them. Take them out. Uh, and just let them be kind of at room temperature for at least a week before you add um, the, you know, heating options that you have, maybe. Mm. Uh, and I do see this in the commentary here. Uh, Milta is reminding me to talk about kind of, quote unquote, dead Campanotis queens. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that uh, our friends over at Ants Canada, like years and years ago, had an event where a Campanotis queen looked totally dead, curled up on her side, uh, legs folded up, and it took her weeks to actually start to move after being in that state of diapause. And since then, I've actually been made aware of this a number of times, there's been lots of occasions where different genera, but mostly Campanotis queens, will come out of that period of diapause and look absolutely dead. Okay, not moving at all. And that's something that I've observed in the wild as well uh, in early spring. And basically, that's you really just want interesting. to be super patient um, uh, when you take the colonies out. If the queen doesn't look right, let her uh, warm up for weeks before you say, oh, she's dead. Wow. Because a lot of people have been tricked about this. Looks like Noble says they've been tricked before as well. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a thing, okay? And this goes back to us not really understanding entirely kind of the science behind diapause. We don't know exactly what, what, what happens. Um, but just be really cautious. Don't give up on your colonies. Um, and uh, kind of allow them to kind of wake up and uh, begin the process. But, uh, yeah, have faith in your queens. Um, <laughs> Because they don't always look great coming out of diapause, but they usually perform in terms of egg laying much better than those queens that don't go through diapause. Okay. Um, we have a few people that are kind of, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to use this word, but antsy about asking their own questions in voice. So let's, can, do you mind if we 
<laughs> do you mind if we take a little break um, and let people just kind of uh, just open the seminar a little bit, and then we'll go back to the the pre-asked questions um, once it dies down a little bit. That sounds great to me. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, anybody want to go first? Why not? Can I do it? <laughs> what was that? Oh my! I'll go, I'll go after Hal. Okay. Good. Uh, I have one. So I only have room temperature, which is about 25, and the attic. Is it fine just going straight between those two? Um, just because there's a lot of uh, sound interference there, would you mind typing that question up in the chat so I can read it? Thanks for everyone's patience. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question. Uh, this person only has kind of availability to room temperature at 25 Celsius and the attic. So they're asking, is it fine to put the ants straight to the attic? Well, we've got to unpack this question just a little bit. Okay, so first question I would have is, are the ants like connected to say a heating cable or a heating pad at this time um in the room temperature room no heating okay so that's their kind of normal state uh you know this this is a really difficult question to answer yeah milt is right that is pretty warm mm -hmm. um just because i don't know the exact species and everything that you're t you're keeping what's really important actually here is that the attic isn't like at a freezing temperature okay so if it's below freezing and the ants go from that temperature you could probably kill them um so you just want to make sure I'm, I'm sorry to say like this is kind of a, a little bit of a problem um if the attic is never never below freezing that's great I do want to address something that I hear no, every no, no. single year. Uh, Miles, I, yeah, may, maybe maybe you read that wrong. He said it's twenty five Celsius, so that's seventy seven Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit in his attic. Yeah, I mean that's that's really really warm. Um, I don't know if the family chooses to live that way, but that that's fine, right? At a for for an ant colony, um, it's more that that is actually quite warm to transition from that temperature to say, uh, let um, let's see, I need a conversion. Alexa, convert 40 Fahrenheit to Celsius. 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, okay, degrees. so you don't want to go from, say, 25 Celsius to 4 or 5 Celsius. Okay, that's, that's a huge transition for an ant colony. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry if I said anybody else echo off, but uh, that was just useful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, Anyway, what I want to say here is that if you can find a better way to gradually change those temperatures, I would encourage you to do it. The important thing is that you don't have a situation where the ants go from really, really warm temperatures to really cold temperatures. One thing I do want to say is that, you know, I get questions every single year about whether or not you can put your ants outside and just like wrap them in blankets. Um, and it's really important to note that like ants and formicaria aren't really producing any heat. And the reason that blankets work for humans is that like the heat that we produce is actually kind of trapped within the blanket uh, and it helps us stay warm. OK, so because ants don't do that, the blanket will maybe keep an ant colony from getting frost on it or uh, from getting exposed directly to ice or snow. But it's not going to keep them any warmer than if they didn't have it. Okay, um, so that's just something to note for everybody to understand, uh, because I get that question literally every year. <laughs> so you can't just put your ants outside in a blanket and that they will stay warm. <laughs> um, Miles, uh, just really quick, uh, how much how much time do you have for us today? I just want to make sure that we get to some of the other questions that people have. Absolutely. Um, I've got another 40 minutes or so uh, available. Okay, um, I think we can continue with... Uh, the seminar side of things. Did anybody else have questions? 
I think, uh, on Crawls. Am I allowed uh, to ask? Yeah, I actually do have a question. Um, this pertains to my Lace's Clever Queen that over the last nine days laid over 100 eggs is, and has become incredibly uh, physiogastric. But can I expect the species to overwinter with larvae, or would they push workers... Uh, push the workers before going into their diapause state. Um, I'm worrying about Formica as well, since my parasite Formica, a Revita queen, has also laid more batches of eggs. Can you remind me what that species was that you first said? Uh, first one was Laceus claviger. Okay. And then I have another parasite Formica, uh, which is a Revita queen. Um, b both have consistently started laying eggs again. Um, and diapause is right around the corner, so am I to be expecting that they will overwinter with their larva, or push to get workers first before going into diapause? Um, so where are these ants? Like, where were these collected? Uh, North Dakota. North Dakota. Nice. I never get anybody from North. Um, let's see. What I would recommend because of the sensitivity of species like what you just mentioned is trying to get those that that brood through to the worker stage um it is mm. wildly uncommon to be successful with those species especially to get a queen to a state where she's physiogastric uh and that's awesome and i'd love to see pictures and video and everything that's yeah please please that's done. awesome um that's like a, that's actually a big deal especially here in the united states because We've had very, very little success with that. Our European counterparts seem, seem to do better with it, but ours are just really, really sensitive animals. Um, so definitely try and get them through, get that batch of workers through before diapause. Now, what I will say is if the larvae seem to stop developing, okay, and mm -hmm. anecdotally, they tend to look a little bit yellower, okay, uh, then you can go ahead and put them into diapause because the, the, the larvae will have suspended their development. But chances are uh, that you're going to want to get these ants through that kind of whole regeneration, and they probably will kind of let you do that, if that makes sense. Oh, okay, yeah, it definitely does. Uh, does a larva typically get a yellowish tinge too, or is that just mainly a visual cue for their diapause state? Um, so this, this is where we kind of diverge from scientist miles to ant keeper miles. Um, so it's a little bit more of a uh, kind of anecdotal thing. The larvae will tend to look a little bit different. They they get that kind of yellowish hue. They look a little bit less moist. Um, okay. But uh, anyway, there's just like a certain look to an ant larva that has suspended development. Uh, and I can certainly provide a few pictures of that. But uh, oh, yeah. if basically, if the larvae stop developing, uh, you will, you'll notice. Uh, and you can go ahead and go through with diapause. Oh, awesome. Uh, thank you, Miles. Yep. Um, really quick, I just want to ask, because I have the Campanados col colony, Campanados Glinolei, I think, um, and uh, I have the issue where I really can't put him in diapause because my family doesn't does not allow me to do uh, Can you say what species that was and where it was collected? Uh, I mean, Chile, I'm going to write the species down in the text. Okay. Um, but so, while, while you're doing that, this is a uh, an issue that I certainly had growing up. I've been keeping ants for 10 years, so that includes, uh, you know, back when I was actually living at home. And uh, parents said, oh, no way are you putting bugs in the fridge, right? That's a pretty common issue for most of our, <laughs> our younger uh, ant keepers. And you generally have a couple of options. You can usually find a place in the garage if you have one. Now, garages are not actually, they're often not very stable temperature-wise. So you are going to want to wrap the colony in a blanket to protect from, say, frost. Uh, and you're going to want to make sure you're monitoring the temperature in the garage. But that is one option that you go with. If you do put them in, say, a garage, you really want to make sure that you're monitoring the temperature there, you're checking on the colony frequently, that kind of thing. Um, if that's not something that's available to you, you can make sure that the uh, ants aren't um, exposed 
to that those warm temperatures. So if you have like a heating pad, heating cable, whatever to keep them warm, you take them off of that. Uh, but when I was uh, keeping ants at home, I wouldn't put my ants through a temperature-based diapause. Okay. And the ant colonies will generally come out okay. You'll see them. They still usually will not... Um, they they usually will will slow their kind of egg production, brood production. They'll stop eating as much. They still need, but but uh, that can happen. Um, Milta is right on the first part of the sentence, but we can't condone the second. Uh, in that, yes, you can ask your parents about a mini fridge. They usually are very energy efficient, small, um, and you just want to make sure that you get one that's fairly reliable. Uh, so that's another option. I do want to switch over a little bit and address this amazing picture uh that we have coming in north dakota yeah guys please check out the the handmade voice text channel um and yeah. posted a picture of his physiogastic queen queen and it's uh, kind of amazing so this is really kind of a, a special thing to see um it's exciting to me kind of as an ant researcher because we have so little success with socially parasitic queens particularly Laceus, uh here in North America. And what you can see there is a queen that is in a state called, basically, she's physogastric, okay? And that is where her ovaries have completely t uh, kind of gone into gear. They're producing eggs rapidly. And that actually causes the abdomen to distend. And uh, that's kind of what you see in those two pictures. You see the queen up there in the top picture. She is not physogastric. You're not seeing egg development there. Uh, you don't see the, the ovaries kicking into gear. And in that second picture, we've got a great image there of a physogastric glacius queen. Um, what a lot of folks don't understand, or at least don't realize, is that many, many ant species, their queens will become physogastric later on in life. So we're used to seeing like Laceus neoniger, for example. And the queens usually look about the same. Uh, and they usually have about the same kind of gaster look to them. But if you uncover a Laceus neoniger queen in the wild, in a colony that's existed for years, you'll usually see one that is physogastric to the extent that she looks like a termite queen. And if you don't know what a termite queen looks like, go look it up. You'll see how the physogastric kind of state distends those plates uh, right there on the abdomen on the gaster. Uh, it's a really special thing to see. And uh, many of the European ant keepers that have had ant colonies for a long time will have queens that go into kind of extreme physogastric states and it really is indicative of a very very healthy ant colony uh so that's great to see sorry i took care of that yeah so the laceous queen doesn't look as extreme as that termite but you do see that may like serious uh, plate separation and everything There we go. Sol just posted a great picture of a uh, probably uh, European Laceus queen uh, who has gone uh, physogastric. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, do we have anybody else who wants to ask questions in voice, or can we continue with the ones that are in the uh, question channel? Okay. Yeah, uh, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so I have... Uh, I, for, I don't know how to pronounce the Aphenogaster occidentalis, I'm pretty sure, colony. In a natural setup, I, I'm not sure what to do for them. Okay. Um, so Aphenogaster occidentalis, uh, where was that uh, collected? Uh, again, I, I'm just, this is based off just uh, people I've asked, and that's what they said it probably is. I'm in a, like, the Redwood Forest, Cal in NorCal. Okay. Yeah, chances are that is the species that you're dealing with. Um, and I'm going to have to ask what a natural setup is to you. I imagine oh. you probably have you know, like a soil setup. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what I mean. Okay. Um, you're going to treat them about the same. You want to make sure that they have access to water. So I don't know if you use a water feeder or test tubes or something like that. But it is important for everybody to understand uh, that no matter what kind of formicarium you have, uh, the ants 
require moisture. And when you put formicaria in, say, a fridge or a mini fridge, you'll actually see that moisture oftentimes will deplete faster even than if you have it at room temperature. Okay, so you want to make sure your ants always have access to water. And that's one thing I would say about uh, putting ants through diapause in like a natural setup, uh, because it's a little bit harder to monitor how moist the area is. Now, if you're dealing with a vivarium that maybe has plants in it, uh, and if it's like these aren't temperate plants or they're uh, perennial, you're going to have to kind of deal with that. Maybe you have to take the plants out, accept that they might die, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, that's kind of one of the one of the things that you have to deal with, I guess, if you're going to choose to keep ants in a setup like that. Okay. Uh, can I ask one more thing? Please. Uh, I I just caught a queen yesterday. I I didn't like expect it. It was like a surprise. I think it's a formica. So so it uh. I just got it doesn't no eggs or anything. I wasn't sure if if like uh, do I just hibernate them the same if they don't like get any get any workers by then? You know, I'm actually I'm really glad that you asked that question because it's something we definitely need to talk about. Um there are ant species particularly in North America. Um I'm sure that they they're this way in other temperate regions that will uh actually have their nuptial flights, their mating flights, uh, quite late into the summer, or even into early fall. And those queens that you collect sometimes won't lay eggs at all. And usually less experienced ant keepers will say, ah, it's a dud, get rid of it. But what's important to know is that oftentimes those ants will actually wait until they've gone through diapause before they lay eggs and begin their colony. One of the great examples in North America is Lacius neo niger, uh, a.k.a. the Labor Day ant that usually flies on Labor Day. Well, in the northern parts of it, its range, it usually doesn't, uh, they usually don't lay any eggs until after winter has passed. So that could be a situation with this formica queen. What I would say is that I don't recommend you just put any queen that you find, say, in the fall into diapause immediately. I'd recommend waiting at least two weeks before you put them through that diapause cycle to make sure that they're not gearing up to lay eggs and you don't interrupt uh, kind of the egg uh, cycle with that queen. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any more uh, voice questions before we continue? Guess not. All right, so we have a question from Fish. He asks, why did ants evolve to hibernate? Couldn't they have evolved to go a long time without food and water? And I guess that's fair. So, Well, that's a good question, Fish. And actually, hibernation or diapause is how ants have evolved to go through a long period of time with food and, and uh, other resources. Um, so that <laughs> actually is the way that they do it. Uh, that, that suspended state kind of development and activity is their way of solving that um, particularly in uh, kind of cool places and uh, Milt is entirely right there ants have been able to live and colonize in areas that went through winter if they didn't kind of go through that natural selection process and uh, kind of evolve to go through diet pause but it is important to understand that Ants aren't, it's not like ants are the only insects that go through diapause. Lots and lots of different insects go through that state. Um, so it's not like something that is specific to ants. Uh, but we do know that some of the changes ants go through uh, may be specific to ants themselves. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Chelv asks um, Do we know that cer several. We do know that several ant species can somehow live, grow, survive in captivity without hibernation, even though they hibernate in nature. It's somehow general knowledge that those ant species will have a shorter span of life, aren't as productive in terms of eggs, etc., as hibernated ones, or aren't growing at that fast linear. Is there some kind of empirical scientific data that can prove or reject hypotheses like, like this? If yes, could those results be generalized for different genera or 
areas of origin? That is a fantastic question. Um, and that's an example where kind of personal anecdotes um, become really well popularized, right? Uh, we don't tend to keep ant colonies long enough and gather good enough data to really be able to say something like that is definitively. Um, but one pretty common kind of rumor that I'm aware of is that Tetramorium immigrans, okay, the immigrant pavement ant, which we don't think is native to North America, um, actually can survive forever without going through major states of diapause. Uh, cool. But we don't necessarily know if that actually if that actually affects the lifespan of the queen we don't know if it affects how many eggs she'll lay how it might have an effect on colony health um and you know there's it's really a difficult thing to study it's something that i've always wanted to to study in different genera but unfortunately it takes like years and years uh, of keeping specific colonies in certain conditions and being able to record data on that. Um, and that's something that maybe, you know, I hope to do later on in my career. It's not something I've been able to do. And I think that goes for a lot of people. What I will say kind of on the anecdotal side is that the genus Campanotus very specifically seems to go through something called obligate dog where the colony will actually fail, fail if it doesn't go through a, a period of diapause. Now, I can't generalize that to, say, a tropical Campanotus. We're talking kind of near Arctic, uh, North American Campanotus, mm. uh, like Cepids, Campanotus pensibanicus, for example. Um, they seem to require that period of diapause for the queen to actually produce the, the next batch of eggs. And you can try and force them to kind of go through diapause without, say, in a fridge. Uh, you can never take the heating cable off. It doesn't seem to work very well. So this is a great example where actually the experiences of ant keepers and keeping really good notes over periods of years can help inform us uh, on these kinds of questions. We do but, have... Uh, the, the, short, the short answer is we don't really know. Um, but we do know that it seems like uh, many different genera, many different species require diapause, and to what extent and in what ways there can be great variation. We do have um, scientific studies on uh, the effects of temperature uh, specifically, so say um, on, on workers. Um, so uh, workers of the same colony um, kept for the duration of their lifespan at various different temperatures. Um, uh, it can exp it can extend the lifespan of the of the um, of the worker cast um, up to four times, I believe. Um, so it would follow naturally that if there is a period um, where you're cooling them down, um, they're, they 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 it 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 should affect the longevity, um, but maybe not in a. Um, we, we don't know in what capacity exactly. And, and I'm happy to share that study um, and a afterwards. I'm just busy right now. Okay. Uh, next question is... Um, I, I just want to note something. Please. Um, in regards to the Formica question earlier, um, ants of the genus Formica usually do not hibernate with any brood, like none of their brood can survive hibernation. So I think um, the likelihood that this queen will still lay eggs is very, very low because they wouldn't make it to workers. They need around two months to make it to workers. This um, also gives you a fairly good idea when to hibernate your formica because it's basically when they have no brood left. Mm. And uh, guys, if, if anybody else has extensive experience, um, especially in other parts of the world regarding hibernation and you'd like to offer um, anecdotal observations um, or things that you've heard otherwise, um, feel free to jump in. Um, I mean, it, 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 we're all trying to just share information here, so. Okay. 
Uh, next question. Uh, Ant Guy asks, uh, is there any biological distinction between hibernating and non-hibernating ants? Yeah, there's plenty of biological distinctions. If you were to look at, um, yeah, uh, let's say, a uh, Campanotus worker ant, um, like Campanotus modoc, uh, and you take one from you know, a colony that's at 60 degrees during the summer and one 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that is, uh, during the summer, and one that, say, is uh, going through diapause at 38 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. There's lots of differences. Um, we know that temperature affects how quickly ants move. Uh, we know it has major effects on their behavior. Uh, pretty much anybody who keeps ants would know that ants at different temperatures will behave differently. Uh, with Campanotus in, in particular, they produce a compound called glycerol that will actually act as an antifreeze in their blood. There is some evidence that that affects their behavior, at least how quickly they can move. Um, so there are major biological differences that occur when ants go through diapause. That's actually sort of the concept of diapause, is that the ants have these physiological changes that help them survive that period of low temperatures or high temperatures, drought, uh, lack of food, that kind of thing. Uh, th these are physical changes that happen within the ants uh, that help them to survive that period. Okay. Thanks, Moss. The next question is um, from Zenery. Uh, many ant keepers experience, lo experience losses during hibernation months, sometime, and sometimes these losses are quite significant. Is there something we should do, we should be doing to help minimize these losses in our colonies? Personally, I have a theory about it, and I don't want to know if you think it is worth testing. My theory is we tend to feed out ant. Sorry. We tend to feed out ant colonies heavy protein diets in order to stimulate healthy colony growth. What if several weeks prior to hibernating our colonies, we th feed them more fatty foods that may give them more insulation or perhaps overfeed them to ensure their bodies have the needed nutrition to sustain them during hibernation? I'm sure that no one would intentionally not provide needed food for their colonies, but could we be underfeeding them or not feeding them the proper diet to sustain hibernation? Other animals in nature build up fat reserves, such as bears, squirrels, etc. Perhaps ants need to do this as well? Hey, you know, that is a, that's a really great question. Um, and it's something that may have been studied, but I am not aware, you know, much research into uh, whether or not ants necessarily kind of stockpile lipids, you know, so fats, mm. uh, for the period of diapause. What we do know is that throughout the year, ants are always collecting pretty much as much food as they can handle. And Coltrane is right in the, there in that you want to make sure that you're providing your ants kind of with really great high quality food, as much of it as kind of they will take, and then maybe even a little bit more. And you just want to make sure that the ants have kind of the availability of whatever nutrition they could possibly need at the time. I think that in our hobby, and uh, you know, it's always kind of risky to generalize, but I think that we generally underfeed our colonies um, because we don't always have a great grasp of what the ants need nutritionally at any given time. So having as much kind of variation within reason in what you feed your ants and making sure that they're not food limited, that's going to result in a healthy colony. Um, mm -hmm. So we can kind of solve this problem without actually knowing the answer to the scientific question, whether or not ants necessarily need lipids going into diapause. We can solve that by just making sure that uh, we have kind of a really well-balanced diet that the ants could stock up on those kinds of nutrients if that's what they needed. Okay. Miles, how much more time do you have? About 20 minutes, maybe? Yeah, I can give about 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. I shouldn't even say I can give. I would love to uh, continue this. <laughs> I've got about 20 minutes, so. Okay. Um, I think you already answered this one. Okay, so Nanny asks, uh, which stages of brood can survive diapause? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, 
the bad news is I don't have like a perfect answer for you, uh, because this does vary uh, in different genera. So I, somebody was speaking earlier as to uh, how Formica generally doesn't overwinter with any brood. I have seen them overwinter with uh, late stage larvae in the past, personally, but it's really a pretty accurate generalization to say that they almost never have uh, brood in the colony through Dinopaws. But then you have Campanotus, okay? In Campanotus, I can't remember if it's first or second instar, but they almost always overwinter with larvae, okay? That go into a state of suspended development. And then you have, um, you know, there's lots of different variation uh, depending on the genus, the species, where they're from, kind of diapause they're going through. So there's no like perfect kind of generalization. What I will say is that eggs almost never survive diapause. And uh, pupae are also very uncommonly seen in diapause. If there's one kind of uh, stage of brood that would be most likely to survive through diapause, uh, that would generally be larvae. And... Uh, I don't know exactly why, but, but they seem to be able to handle it better. And the ants will actually very purposely get them to a certain state in larval development before uh, they sort of stop developing for diapause. <sighs> okay. Martin asks, uh, short period hibernation for trop tropical or subtropical ants, is it a positive or negative thing to do in regards to the overall lifespan of the colony? The reason for this question is that keepers assume tropical ants don't hibernate, period. But most tropical species go through short winters in the wild with temps at 5 to 8 degrees Celsius in many Asian countries. I tend to leave my ants exposed to the ongoing local weather conditions, but many say it's not positive that, and that no matter what, this cool down isn't positive to tropical or subtropical species. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that's, it's a good question. Um, and one of the, the themes of talking about diapause is that we don't know very much about it. Um, but what I would say, just kind of as somebody who's kept ants for a long time, is that there seems to be substantial benefit to trying to give your ants kind of as natural of conditions, at least uh, kind of you know, ambient temperature and humidity and what, as you can, as close to kind of what happens in the wild. So from my point of view, there is probably a benefit to trying to mimic that, at least to some extent. And that is going to cause some variation in the brood production, the kinds of foods that the ants target, their behavior. There will be effects on if the temperatures and conditions change. And just from what we know in North, from kind of more temperate studies, and that that is beneficial to ants, I think there's a good chance that there are benefits to tropical ants to having some kind of seasonal variation. Okay. Great. And, um... Okay, I think that's. I think you've answered everything else in the question section. I think we can open this up to general discussion and um, uh, voice questions again, uh, if anybody wants to continue. And uh, I guess, um, yeah, you have like maybe 10 minutes left, I guess. Um, so anybody have questions you'd like to ask or um, insights you'd like to share uh, regarding um, uh, diapause specifically? <laughs> Did everybody already get their questions in, I guess? <laughs> I guess people are busy typing. Ah, yeah. No, there are oh, quite okay. a few. So Nair says, so I figure for parasitic formica, I should let all the host pupae close before I put them in? Oh, absolutely. Definitely let those pupae close. Makes sense. Yeah, I can second that too. Uh, 
Alistranaut asks, does Chromatogaster Sarasi uh, from Ontario, Canada also have to go through diapause before going into laying larvae? Um, from what I understand, they usually will go through that diapause before they lay eggs. They, they don't lay larvae. So just as a reminder, uh, the ants and ant queen will lay eggs. The eggs will then develop into larvae. Those larvae will go through a certain set of different kind of instars. We call them instars. Then they will actually go into a state called pupa or pupae. Sometimes they have a cocoon, uh, depending on uh, the genus of ants, or actually the subfamily of ants. Um, and then they will then uh, eclose, and that's kind of our technical term to hatch as worker ants. But like I said, if you found a chromatogaster queen and she laid eggs, then you don't want to force her to go into hibernation uh, because the, or, or diapause, I should say, because chances are um, they will, you know, she's going to go through that cycle with those eggs. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you got to also understand laying eggs takes an incredible amount of energy from a queen. And she has a finite amount of kind of energy uh, in terms of nutrition, the kind of energy she can put towards laying eggs. So if you have a queen that lays a bunch of eggs, feeds larvae, that's even worse, and then you put it into diapause and that brood dies, the chances that it's going to be able to survive diapause and then lay more eggs, get those larvae through to uh, is much lower. So if they do lay eggs, you, you want to make sure that you're trying to help them go through that, uh, get workers before they go into diapause. An exception to that is Campanotus. So if you have Campanotus and they get really little larvae that are pretty fuzzy and they don't, they don't actually go through any more development, those ones are ready for hibernation or diapause. Okay. Um... So it looks like we've got quite a few questions coming in on the chat. Yeah. Um, okay. Do naked pupae close? Is there a better term to use? Yeah, great, great question. Naked pupae, do we close? So eclosion is actually that term uh, where an ant goes from that pupal stage to an adult worker ant. It has nothing to do with whether or not the pupa has a cocoon around it. Okay. Um, Mep asks, "How should I go about change? How should I go about changing setups during diapause? I've lost a lot of colonies due to mold during diapause, and I would like to know how to go about it in the future." That's a great question. Uh, this is going to be pretty dependent on kind of what the setups that you're using are, what kind of formicaria, what species, that kind of. Thing. Uh, what I recommend doing is making sure that the formicarium is as well prepared for diapause as possible. So if you've got some mold developing, especially if you're using like plaster of Paris, for example, deal with it before diapause. If you're going to deal with it, deal with it with the first few weeks of diapause. Um, you know, there's lots of ways you can move colonies into other nests. I think we've covered that a little bit on the Ant Network channel. But a lot of people here in the chat going to be quite knowledgeable on how to do that. Um, if a colony absolutely needs to be moved during diapause, I would recommend slowly warming them and then exposing them that to kind of a new nest. If you have to, you can manually move the colony. If you do that, you want to make sure that they're cool when you do it. I actually was taught how to use CO2 by one of my mentors, Ray Mendez, to actually kind of knock the ants out for transport. But if you're not um, experienced in using that technique, you don't really want to risk an entire colony to use it. So there have been rumors I've seen online about using CO2. I will do a demonstration on the channel at some point on how to do that. But uh, I guess I bring it up so that, you, that people understand that they need to take caution with using that method. Yeah. Um... Tost, uh, Tostinus uh, has also uh, shared his setup for knocking out um, small colonies um, 
So he, he, he actually like has like gear recommendations and all that. So maybe um you, we could we could poke him and see if he can bring if he if he'd be happy to share that again. Sounds good. Okay. Um Nair asks, what about preventing flooding when you take tubes out of the cold? Just tip the end of the tube up? Ah, uh, this, this is also a really important question. So one thing that we do cover the Ant Network's channel in our test tube uh, tutorials, we've got two of them there, is that we recommend you always have your test tube nests uh, at a slight angle, such that the water reservoir is, um, you know, at the bottom uh, where gravity is going to pull water down and then the ants actually have a dry high ground to escape to in the event that there is some sort of flooding right in, in the event that the kind of the integrity of your reservoir is compromised uh, and this is something that happens if test tubes are brought down to quite low temperatures and then brought up quite quickly now it's usual it's pretty common that if you take test tubes out of the fridge and just leave them on the counter uh, you are going to see some water kind of at that end of the reservoir. And if you don't monitor that and be careful with that, it can definitely flood and uh, you know get to the brood, get to the ants, and cause serious issues. And that's one of the reasons that having major temperature uh, fluctuations occur while the ants are in diapause can be kind of risky, um, especially if they're in like a test tube setup and you don't have that test tube at the right angle. It's going to be really difficult for people, or for the ants rather, to kind of escape that. You also should note that ants move much uh, more slowly and much more clumsily uh, when they're cold. So if a queen is to fall in water and she's being kept at, say, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, her ability to get out of that water is going to be much less than, say, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I've said this many times, usually almost every time I'm on the server, I don't recommend that people use test tubes as a long-term solution for keeping ants. I, I think that there are lots of issues with them uh, and that diapause is one of those areas where we use a lot of colonies that are in test tube setups. All right, let's keep moving. We're going to go a little bit faster uh, for the last couple of questions. Okay, so uh, Ank asks um, for his Solenopsis molesta. It's a never-ending sea of uh, eggs. Larva and pupa. Uh, should he uh, put them into diapause anyway? Uh, where are they collected? That's pretty much always going to be my first question. Probably North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota still. Um, yeah, my not uh, specifically. I'm sorry. Where? North Dakota. Uh, North um, Dakota. Okay. Yeah, why not North Dakota? Yeah, yeah, no, I missed, I missed the username, so that makes sense. Um, is this a colony you've had for multiple years, or is this a first-year colony? Uh, this is a first-year colony. Uh, first took it out of diapause beginning of March, I believe, and uh, from there they just started going crazy on the brood. That's awesome. Um, so myrmecines seem to handle longer periods without diapause than other... Um, subfamilies and what i would recommend is that you let them go through and continue developing uh through say late october maybe early november and then uh actually take them off of if you have a heating solution take them off and put them through a short diapause you might see a little bit of brood cannibalization that's normal um, especially in species that don't have these like serious egg laying cycles that, say, Formica and Campanotus tend to go through. So Lacius as well is a great example uh, of a species that goes through these batch-like egg cycles. Hmm. Okay, so if they just continuously lay and uh, the continuous life cycles is uh, continuing to go on, that's uh, pretty normal to just put them into a small diapause, like you said, and then uh, potentially there will be some brood cannibaliz uh, cannibalization, but that's all normal? Yes. It seems to be... Uh, important. Again, this is kind of anecdotal because we haven't done great studies on this yet, but uh, it seems to be good for the long-term health of the colony that they still go through some sort of state of diapause, especially if they're in a place like North Dakota. Okay. okay. Um, thanks again. All right. So, uh, Chef from the Czech Republic asks, uh, he's got a small colony of Campanatus barbaricus, uh, queen and five workers. Should, they, should he hibernate them this year? 
Uh, that depends. I, I kind of answered a similar question here. It depends on where the brood is at in development. So if they have yeah. like a few small larvae, uh, you should probably put them through diapause. If they're like actively producing brood, there's a lot going on. By he says, um, let them, he says let them two larvae or one egg and one larva. One egg and one larva? Yeah. <laughs> so not much. Uh, yeah, absolutely put them through diapause. Okay. And um, I think that's the end of the questions. Uh, Milta has an insight he'd like to share. He says, uh, one year I found, I went anting just the day when we had four inches of snow on the ground. It melted and I decided to go anting in a bog for some reason. Among the patches of moss, I stepped on a twig, no thicker than a standard test tube. It was so brittle that I flattened it where I'd stepped and it didn't snap at all, which was odd. This is what made me notice it. Touching it further, I found it collapsed when disturbed, and then I located a small group of a dozen or so temnothorax or stenmata workers all huddled around their queen. It amazes me to this day to think that they survived the winter in such a small twig that broke to the touch on the surface through multiple snowfalls. I collected the colony, of course. So that was just an insight he wanted to share, and I wanted to get that for the for the transcript, um, because it's... It's it's a neat little insight. So I mean, I I guess the the takeaway there is they're pretty hardy. Um, just ants in general. Um, I mean, the a a, a big takeaway um, from what Miles has been saying is that a diapause is kind of like a thing of necessity. Um, and uh, another uh, uh, Noble also touched on this. Um, they're gonna do their best. Um, so diapause it's more of an art than a science, um, they'll, they'll adjust to the conditions. So, Just don't freeze. Um, yeah, don't freeze. Temnothorax <laughs> <laughs> are ridiculously tough. They can survive um, laying in the sun in a small acorn at plus 35 degrees Celsius, and they can survive um, minus 30 degrees Celsius lying on the surface in the snow. So they are really ridiculously tough. Oh, they are what? also extremely good at surviving starvation. Wow. Okay, so maybe maybe more the exception than the rule, but... <laughs> um, so the, uh, the paper that I just put in the chat there, um, that species actually is now temnothorax, uh, not leptothorax. There was a change that occurred. This is an old paper. Um, but it's just in case anyone's interested in temnothorax diapause. Okay. I think that's all the questions we've got. Um, Miles, I really want to thank you for taking the time uh, to set aside the time to really field all these questions and kind of um, uh, help help a lot of a lot of people um, who who just are really kind of lost with this. Um, kind of have the um, uh, the guidelines on what they should do and how to best take care of their colonies through diapause. Absolutely. I really appreciate kind of the opportunity to come in and talk to you guys and talk with you guys, uh, engage with the community. Um, it, it's one of the, it's one of my favorite things to do. So I, I, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. All right. And also thanks for all the great questions, you guys. We had a really good set of questions here that got into lots of different subjects kind of related to diapause. So that was excellent. Yeah, I was really impressed with the variety. Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording. I think that's it.